Good evening, Yacht Club members. Tom Kowalski speaking in. Um, to, this is a continuation of our virtual platform speaker series from the Saucer Yacht Club. Uh, as you know, we continue to be under shelter in place. There has been some encouraging news on this matter, and we don't have anything specific at this particular time about a reopening date, but it is improving in the sense that there is the beginning of, of softening on the regulations. And of course, we will abide by what Marin County gives us in detail. As soon as we know, we'll be sending out emails and videos in terms of you know, how we reopen and under what, uh, what limits and parameters, et cetera. Tonight we have three speakers, which is a special event for us. Typically, we just have one. Uh, the speakers are from the American Wild Horse Campaign Program. Uh, the first speaker is someone who introduced me to this topic, and I'll be very frank with you, I did not know much about this at all prior, prior to meeting uh, Terry Duque. Terry Duque um, is an industrial designer with a master's in fine arts. She has extensive experience in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, when she left that, she took a big change in her life and went to Thailand to open an Asian elephant sanctuary. She also was a designer for the Phillips Innovator Whitbread boat, a round the world boat, and this boat was highlighted in our last speaker, uh, Ron Holland. Terry has two dogs that are rescues and they think of themselves as ponies, which is apropos. Right. Our second speaker, Mr. Dustin Brown, is a senior vice president um, for RBC in San Francisco, California. He is a Marin County native. Uh, as vice president of the American Wild Horse Campaign and actually has a buckskin Mustang Leroy that was uh, uh, from the Wild Horse Territory in Northern California. And finally, Suzanne Roy is the executive director of the American Wild Horse Campaign. Um, she is also on the Gray Whale Coalition and resides in the Davis area um, with her husband, family, and their uh, beautiful horse, Cobalt. So please welcome the Saucer Yacht Club the American Wild Horse Campaign. Wow. Tom, thank you so much. Um, it's really an honor to be here and to know you. And some of you I might have met um, over the New Year's um, the boat lighting party. But right now I'm in Menlo Park with Tigger and Einstein. I'm a big glass of wine and they're having a doggy bone. Um, and as Tom mentioned, I worked on the wood bread that represented N.V. Phillips. And um, as some of you might know, you know, sailing is pretty exciting, especially if you're sailing on the North Sea. It's not only exciting, it's pretty cold. But now many years later, I'm here and I'm part of something just as exciting, um, just as beautiful and very important and of course wild. So I'm with the Wild Ameri uh, American Wild Horse Campaign and our work is to save wild horses and burrows in the American West. And it's a really critical time for them. So my first question is, how many of you have ever seen wild horses? I don't know if you can raise your hand, but, and I can't see all of you. Russell, maybe you can. Well, for those of you who have, they are in the West, they are amazing, and they'll take your breath away. But for those of you who haven't, I want to show you a little video here that will just show you a tiny part of how beautiful and magnificent they are. So Russell, do you want to cue that up? Here we go.
Okay, so you saw um, stallions, you saw a herd, you saw a foal. Right now it's foaling season in the high deserts. Um, and the other thing that you might have noticed is that horses are social animals. They are always together. So before I introduce Dustin, our next speaker, I'm going to show you a little intimate um, video of him and his boy, Leroy. So Russell, take it away. Hi, my name is Dustin Brown, and I'm AWHC's newest board member. And this is my boy, Leroy. We're really excited to have him on board and helping us with our campaign for America's Wild Horses. Welcome, Dustin. Thank you very much. You've been aware of the wild horse issue, paying attention to what's been going on with our wild horses on the range. What is the issue for you, and where do you see problems being solved? Well, I think at the core of it, it has to be the Mustangs, right? Number one, it has to be their freedom, their health, and their independence. And that's just something that we've all chosen to take ownership of and try to be an advocate for them. Because as we all know, they, like all animals, don't have a voice. So I think primarily it's about acknowledging them as special creatures and trying to preserve them in their wild, precious habitat, which we're losing so much of in, in so many ways. It goes deeper than that when you get into uh, the politics and the finances of the issue. And I think like many other issues, people are invested in seeing our, our tax dollars spent appropriately and programs being successful. And I think there's a lot of room for improvement in that area in terms of managing these beautiful horses, preserving their wild nature and heritage, and still accomplishing other goals that exist because we are in a, a community with, with multiple goals and motives. You know, there's such a big difference between rescue and prevention. It's an exhausting, endless task to keep an empty bucket under the faucet when it's just flowing. So in a world of efficiency, you want to be efficient with your money and your time and your resources, and you want to see an impact for whatever you're committed to. Of all the nonprofits I've seen and had the pleasure of, of being around, American Wild Horse Campaign has done as good of a job as I've ever seen managing a budget hitting really hard with impact, you know, staying engaged and on the forefront of, of what's going on for our cause. And that's just something I can really get behind, hopefully make some positive impact and change for, for these guys and, and for all of us. So that's a little bit about Dustin and his boy, but Dustin, would you like to come on now and just talk about wild mustangs and burrows? Yeah, thanks, Terry. Hello, everybody. Hope everyone's holding up all right. I uh, not only am a Marin native, but I lived in Sausalito for about eight years. And uh, although I never had the pleasure of being a Sausalito Yacht Club member, I, I snuck in for lunch and a drink every now and again. So um, I know you guys have a, a really special club there and want to thank you all for letting us be a uh, part of your, your virtual experience. Um, yeah, I just want to start, you know, loosely talking about, you know, my, uh, my entry into working with the American Wild Horse Campaign and a little bit from the heart about, you know, why horses and particularly Mustangs are important to me and, and then tell you a little bit about the work that we do. Um, I come from a long line of animal lovers. Uh, I wouldn't quite say we were, you know, Tiger King Joe exotic, but it wouldn't be uncommon to come home and have a, a baby possum, you know, that uh, mom rescued from wild care um, at the house or uh, a stray dog that was pregnant that needed a place to have babies and uh, a few other stories that I, I won't bore you with. But um, we've been animal lovers our, our whole lives. And about the time when I graduated high school and, and went off to college, my parents picked up an interest in horses and, uh, you know, typ typical of them going zero to a hundred, they uh, adopted an untouched wild Mustang from the Bureau of Land Management um, that had been rounded up uh, near the Oregon, uh, California border in the Devil's, Guard, Devil's Garden herd. And, uh, and we adopted Leroy and Leroy was about three years old and uh, he was a big, strong stallion and uh, now gelding. And, um, I watched him change the relationship between all of us over the years. And from the very first moment that I met that horse, 
you know, I could tell that he was a, a mirror or a reflection of, you know, myself and my energy and wherever I was at. And that one of the first lessons that he gave to, to us was, you know, he required that we become very present and very intent, um, pure, pure intent, and uh, in order for him to, to trust us and um to let us eventually get on his back and do some incredible incredible things with him over the years um and also how much you know the way that he demanded we communicate with each other helped the way that we communicated with ourselves and i began to really understand and and connect with why horses are good for you know post-traumatic stress and you know, cancer patients and anxiety and children with autism, you know, having never spoken a word um, for their entire life, getting on the back of a horse and walking around the arena and, and speaking for the first time and countless other incredible, very, very special moments and gifts that these horses have given people. Um, and so that began the journey for all, for all of us to really get connected with these animals and start riding a lot more and start doing a lot of of, of therapy work and, and rescue work. And um, my mom, Sarah, who's on the call right now, you know, decided to get very involved in the early stages of advocacy for these wild Mustangs, showing up with Suzanne and a small group outside the Capitol steps and, uh, you know, holding up picket signs and fighting for what she believed in and, you know, being an advocate for the voiceless, uh, the voiceless wild Mustang in Burrow. And uh, that was all very, very inspiring to me. Uh, as I began to have my own relationship and experience with horses. So, you know, when I got out of college and started working and started having a desire to, you know, do something in the community um, uh, to make an impact, uh, very serendipitously when I was ready inside to find that cause, um, very, very grateful and flattered that Suzanne and the American Wild Horse Campaign reached out to me and asked me if I'd be interested in joining the board. And I knew enough about the organization to not even have to think about it. I, I wanted to be involved. And the more I've, I've learned prior to joining the board and now being a board member about how unique our organization is, um, the work that we do and why it's so important, um, really just continues to, uh, to mean so much to me. You know, there are, um, one of our lobbyists, a gentleman named Steve Block, hope I'm allowed to say that. Um, he, uh, you know, he came up to me, um, after we held an event at the battery in San Francisco and he, he pulled me aside and he said, Dustin, you know, I have to tell you if, if a nonprofit in almost every other arena I've ever worked with goes out of business, you know, they lose their funding or the, the benefactor ceases to exist. Uh, there's a hundred that'll just come right back up, pop right back up in their place and gladly take their, their donor money and gladly continue the work um, that, that the organization was doing. He said, if American Wild Horse Campaign ceases to exist, that's it. There's, there's nobody doing the work that you all are doing. And I want you to understand how important that is and how much that means. Um, and really what that means is, you know, we're not a, a rescue organization. Um, I will say that our uh, two of our board members, uh, Ellie Phipps Price and Alicia Getz, incredibly huge-hearted, wonderful women. Between the two of them, they do have Mustang and, and rescue horse sanctuaries. Uh, they have 6,000 acres of private land that they purchased. They don't take donations. Ellie takes a little bit, but they pretty much <laughs> fund these on their own. And they have you know, 750 horses that they've rescued. So all of us on the board and everyone that are really our main supporters are of course involved in rescue, but that's really not the point of our organization. You know, we are fighting for lasting policy and legislation. Um, we're, we're fighting to protect the wild horses and burrows that are left out on the range. We're fighting to manage the herd populations that exist humanely and cost effectively. And in a nutshell, before we get into the details and question and answer, you know, what's going on is something that I felt very passionate about, which is you have, you know, one of the two 
most iconic symbols of American freedom, you know, the bald eagle and the wild Mustang. You know, I love a, I love a good bald eagle, no doubt, but the wild Mustang literally helped us build this country on its back. And I think that there's a lot that we owe to this animal. Um, it is probably the strongest symbol of American, you know, be, you want to talk about Americans being wild and free, um, something that we're very proud of. I think the American wild horse is, is just the perfect poster child for that. And yet, you know, their ability to be wild and, and free is really under, um, uh, under attack. You know, they are being essentially systematically extinct. And I don't mean to be dramatic. I'm not an extremist in any way in my life, I don't believe. Um, but those are just the facts, is that we have another example of uh, a small group of, of interests profiting, um, essentially exploiting uh, a voiceless uh, population. And I just think that that's wrong. Um, you know, if we're all going to agree that wild horses need to be managed on public lands, that's okay. Uh, but let's, let's not waste our taxpayer dollars doing it. You know, let's not abuse these, these animals while we do it. Um, let's, let's make sure that, you know, everyone that is, that it has a representative voice in the community can come to the table and we can all give and take and find a, a solution. Um, and then it's done cost effectively. You know, when, when, when we get into the numbers here on really what's going on, it's, it's, a, it's appalling. Um, and so this hit, you know, and then there's an environmental aspect to this as well, which is, you know, deep in our core for all of us that are involved. And so it, it hit on a lot of points for me that I was passionate about. Um, and, and that's really what motivated me to, uh, to get, to get involved and why that's important. So, um, I don't want to get too, too long winded. Um, we have a couple of slides to show you some of the, some of the facts that we think are important of, about this issue, um, and then open it up for some, you know, some questions and, and see what's of interest to you all, um, given what you've heard. So if we can move to the, the next slide, that would be great. Um, so for those of you that don't know, um, you know, and most people don't, you know, especially in, in the Midwest and in the South and in the East, I, I talk to people who have ridden horses their entire life and they, you know, they kind of look at me and say, we still have wild horses roaming on, on Western public lands. I didn't know that. And this is what's going on with them. I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, so these are the, these are the 10 Western states where our wild horses still exist. Um, they uh, part, part of what we do is uh, land acquisition was just a new kind of element that we've branched off on and we're acquiring critical wild horse habitat. Uh, Nevada is our first location for that. So starting a, essentially a land conservation trust in uh, critical wild horse territory. Um, and if we can move to the next slide, please, Russell. Um, they are, before we show this video, they're essentially losing their place on our, our public lands. Um, and again, not to, to attack any other interests, but uh, the, the, the main uh, challenge are a very small group of uh, subsidized cattle ranchers that get to graze their cattle on public land. You know, 95 plus percent of the beef that is produced in this country is produced on private land where the landowner has purchased the land or it's been in the family for generations and they are essentially um, footing the bill on their own dime to, to raise the cattle. And then you have a, a, a really what amounts to a small group of the beef production in the United States that, um, that has a significant subsidy, a significant subsidy, a, an amount per head per month that um, you, you, you would not believe. Uh, I believe it's, Suzanne, correct me if I'm wrong, $2.50 a month, maybe a little higher than that. Oh, Suzanne, uh, Russell, I think you may have to unmute Suzanne. I'm getting to her. Okay. Sorry. When they go on mute, then I have to unmute them. That's all right. Oh, Suzanne. There we go. Oh, you have to accept, I think, Suzanne. Okay. Sorry, guys. Okay. There you go. Okay. It's a one dollar and thirty-five cents per animal per month. And the equivalent to graze on private land in the West is well over twenty dollars per animal per month. 
So it's a very big tax subsidy in the grazing fees. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. my facts straight. Um, so, you know, essentially we have 200, and again, this is going to do a better job of, of myself explaining this, but we essentially have 245 million acres of public land that's managed by our tax dollars. Um, 155 million of those acres are for livestock and uh, you can be the judge if you think that there's a fair allotment for um, for wild horses. Um, but well, we can play play this video, please, Russell, and then and we can continue. Sure. Here we go. Thank you. The BLM manages 245 million acres of public land. Livestock are allowed to graze on 155 million of those acres, but only share 17 percent of that with wild horses. And to make matters worse, the BLM gives 80% of the forage to livestock and wild horses are left with the scraps. The roundups are inhumane and they're also creating a larger problem. That's, a, that's enough, yeah. So part of that larger problem is, is mother nature and evolution. Um, you know, instead of cost-effective, humane ways to, to manage, even if we agreed with the Bureau of Land Management and how many horses should be allowed to roam per herd management area. There's a different way to do it rather than, you know, hiring very expensive, aggressive helicopter companies to fly, you know, within tens of feet of these animals and push them very violently for miles through chutes into holding pens, breaking up, you know, herds and bands and I'm sorry to be graphic, but running horses to death and, and, and dismemberment. Um, you know, there are, are much better ways that we can achieve this goal, even if we don't really agree with the goal in the first place. And that's our, that's our main objective is to um, accept the terms, you know, for the most part that the, the, the government is asking for in terms of long-term herd management area numbers, but to do it in a way that doesn't spend literally hundreds of millions of dollars and and come at the uh, at the inhumane expense of, of these animals. Um, Russell, may we go to the next slide, please? Um, so this is a little bit more of yeah. Th this is a, a video that really kind of summarizes a, a, everything that we've talked about and really what goes on out there. Um, the roundups are are pretty emotional. They're they're pretty tough to watch. Um, the public is. Uh, held by armed federal guard miles away from the roundup sites um, in very strategic locations so that you know we can't witness what's going on which should tell you a lot in the first place um, so let's watch this video and then and then continue <laughs>
So, you know, that, that's a tough video to watch. And, um, you know, re respectfully, you know, the government's mismanagement of this wild horse program for a long time has led to uh, a really difficult situation where we have tens of thousands of horses essentially in long-term holding. It's, it's uh, eerily similar to our, our penitentiary uh, situation in the United States where you have you know, private profit over incarceration of these horses. Um, we, we do need to manage these herds but we need to do it in a humane way and in a cost-effective way. So, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I know not, we're all tired of, of bad news and doom and gloom news, but unfortunately it's necessary to brief you all on, on the issue. Um, we have a really hopeful, strong, positive, solution-based, uh, cooperative, collaborative group of people that help to do what we do. And again, we do that through legislation. Um, we, work on, we work with both sides of the aisle. We're willing to have the conversation and compromise and find something better than the, the failed approach that we've had for a while. Um, we have over 800,000 supporters that, that are our voice for advocacy. Um, I mentioned the land trust where we're acquiring critical habitat to help protect these horses. Litigation, you know, we, we aren't afraid to, to file a lawsuit to stand up for something that we like. I think something I haven't mentioned is, you know, unfortunately, um, a lot of these horses after they get round up and they aren't adopted, they end up, they end up with the kill buyers and the kill pens and they get sent to slaughter. And um, human consumption, animal consumption, it's, it's not pretty what happens to these horses. And, all the way down the funnel from the top, from the helicopters to the holding pens to the kill buyers, you are making, there is big profits uh, being made off the exploitation of, of these animals and the mismanagement. Um, and probably what we're most excited about and most proud about is we operate the largest humane management program for wild horses in the world. We just completed a year long study of PZP, which is essentially birth control administered by you know volunteers at a fraction of the cost um, that the government is spending essentially creating more of a problem rather than fixing it and it's very very hopeful we can effectively take care of you know 50 percent of the problem uh, with this solution and i say 50 percent honestly because some of these sources are tough to get to and we had a board meeting this you know this morning talking about creative ways to partner with um, you know, hunters and trackers and different outfits that can go into the more difficult areas and dart these horses. And it's going to take creative, cooperative, collaborative solutions to really, you know, solve the entire problem. But here we have, you know, this PZP program that we've implemented that's been incredibly effective. And the volunteers essentially go out into the wild and find the wild herds and dart and track the mares and administer PZP, which keeps them from uh, having, you know, giving birth for a year or two. Um, and they love it. You know, it's, it's a whole new potential solution for us. So um, the flip side of that is the uh, All right. Somebody wants to join the meeting. Um, you know, the, the, round, the roundups and the sterilization, you know, and the, again, I don't want to overdo the doom and gloom, but, you know, the sterilization measures are, are pretty, pretty terrible as well. Um, they're actually causing the horses to breed faster. Um, you know, they're, it's taking away their natural, uh, their natural instincts. When you go and geld a stallion out on the range, you're taking away a lot of its natural wildness and it's not being transferred on to the next generations. And that's a problem for us in terms of preserving what these animals really are, which are wild, beautiful creatures. So um, our PZP program is probably something that we're, we're most excited about that we're fighting for. Um, and uh, I think that's it for me. Um, thank you all for listening. And I think we have a bunch of questions in the queue and Suzanne and Terry are, are here to, to help answer those questions as well. And um, you know, again, thank you for your time. And, and if you have any interest, we'd, we'd love your support and uh, to be a part of our organization.
Thank you, Thank Dustin. So Suzanne, maybe um, Russell, you want to current curate the questions? Yeah, we have a lot of questions that have come in, uh, just sort of starting with, uh, Tom had a couple right off the bat. Why don't we go to you while everybody else is coming up with a couple more. But Tom, you have the floor. Well, my questions are this. Number one, define public grazing lands. Are these parks? Are these national monuments? Is just this open space out in Nevada desert, California desert, et cetera? Yeah. Your, yes. Yeah. Um, these, uh, the, the wild horses that we're talking about are protected by the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act which was passed in 1971. It's one of the first environmental laws that was passed in the 70s when all those important laws were passed. The horses, the, the wild horses were protected as symbols of freedom before the bald eagles were protected. And now they're the only two animals that are protected by a specific law naming the individual species. Um, and they are you know, for their symbolic and cultural value. And the, the law protects them on public land managed by the Bureau of Land Management and the um, U.S. Forest Service. And so they are on approximately 27 million acres of BLM land, as that graphic said, and much, much smaller number of acres of Forest Service land. Um, the Forest Service manages a much smaller number of horses. So that's the land that we're talking about. And yes, it's big, vast, huge open space in the high deserts. Um, half the horses are in Nevada. California, we have a number of herds in the north and we have a number of borough herds in the south. Um, and they're in those 10 Western states that Dustin showed the slide of. And what about diseases? I mean, are, you know, are, there, are they in any inbreeding diseases or anything like that with the herds? Hmm. Well, by and large, the herds are very fit and very healthy. Um, and, you know, occasionally you'll see a disease that affects domestic horses. Oftentimes it's brought in by domestic horses that are um, come, you know, being ridden in the areas, um, like strangles or something, but that's a very rare occasion. Um, in, there are instances of inbreeding, you'll, you'll see clubfoot or, or some of those things in herds that the BLM has managed down to such a low level that they've basically destroyed their genetic viability. But, the, but again, that's the minority. Um, the vast majority of the horses are amazing, fit, healthy, majestic looking animals. They're in good shape, yeah. Awesome. Any other questions, Tom? Uh, yes. I, what, one final question. I, I recall that their, their gene pool may actually go back to the Spanish conquistadors. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So the interesting thing about horses is the horse uh, as a species evolved in North America. Um, so this is, a, this is a native reintroduced species that we have today out on our public lands. So the horse went extinct here 10 to 12,000 years ago, but mm. it went only locally extinct, not globally extinct. So the horses had migrated over the Bering Land Bridge. They were in Asia, domesticated, made their way to Europe, and then came back with the Spanish um, explorers in the 1500s. And, but when, they were, when the horse came back, it was returning a native species to the land where they evolved. So they're, they're highly adapted for the environment that they mm -hmm. live. And then when they escaped or were turned loose, they thrived. Um, and at one point at the turn of the century, there were 2 million wild horses that roamed the West. Wow. Yeah. I had no idea. I had no idea. Great answer. All right, for the next question, we'll go to Colleen. Uh, you have a great question in chat. You've been unmuted. Hi there. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, hi, Dustin. Good to see you. Great presentation. Very um, touching videos, but I was interested. Um, I imagine that a lot of your funding comes from individual donations. Correct me if I'm wrong. Have you guys been impacted by the pandemic and the economic downturn there? And then a completely different 
question was, I was, you know, very compelled by the idea of these horses as in a symbol of American freedom. I didn't realize that they were one of only two animals that are, are protected that way. Um, but that seems like a powerful way to start creating some narrative change that maybe we could get a broader base of support across the United States, people that are um, you know, behind that and willing to put pressure or support the idea of more humane management. So just interested if you guys are working on that or, or, or what that might look like. Yeah. Um, so with regard to your first question, um, so far the pandemic has not seemed to affect our, our work. I mean, we're, we're hanging in there pretty strong. Um, it's a little hard to tell. There's a lot of uncertainty. You know, as a nonprofit organization, we rely on that end of year fundraising time to bring in a significant amount of our funding annually. And nobody knows what, you know, December, November is going to look like. There's a lot of uncertainty. So it's, it's a little unsettling. Um, but so far, we're doing okay. And our work has continued, you know, unabated. Even our fertility control darters are out. Um, social distancing on the range isn't hard. And so they've been continuing the work all through the pandemic. And um, so we're holding strong so far. Um, and then with regard to the other question, yeah, um, the the majesty, I just had a call with a Congressman Raul Grijalva, who's the chair of the Natural Resources Committee, and he, he said to us, don't underplay the majesty of the horses. You know, you can get lost in the facts and the figures and whatever, but don't uh, don't underestimate the power of the majesty and the history of the horses um, in in getting people to support your cause. And he was talking about members of Congress. So um, we do have to um, establish that value for the horses before we dive into the issues of, of what's happening. No. Um, and we put, we have put a big emphasis on um, building the grassroots support so that we can get these policy changes that are necessary, but we always need help in spreading the word. That's why we're doing presentations like this, and we're, you know, we we um, we have a very robust social media following of 800,000 and a big email list, and we're continuing to grow that so that we can have that uh, grassroots support. Yeah, I'm, I'm incredibly proud. Thank you, Colleen. It's good to see you too. And I'm, I just want to say I'm incredibly proud for how fast this organization, how much this organization has grown since inception. Um, and really, if you take the time to look at the numbers, um, you know, the impact that we have relative to our budget is, is pretty powerful. I mean, we fight well above our weight and, um, you know, every dollar, really does count for us and it really does matter um and we hit we hit really hard with it so um you know but yet we're i feel that we're kind of right at the verge of you know we've come a really long way and now we're right on the verge of, of really making some some big big impact and and growing into an even bigger organization so it's a it's a pretty wonderful time i know colleen is actually executive director of battery powered foundation which some of you might know in san francisco and they do incredible work and give huge grants to um you know organizations where they know that the money's going to really make a difference um and that uh that certainly is is the case for us great we have a question from kristen i've just unmuted you kristen are you there Sorry. <laughs> um, I think, my, yeah, my question was just how to follow up and how do we get in touch with you um, if we're interested in, in donating or getting involved? Um, is it easy to reach you? Is it on the website? Um, yeah. Here, if, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Suzanne. No, you, the next slide I think has your emails, right? Do we have that last slide in there? Uh, there you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If everyone can see the slide, um, and of course, all, our contact information is on the on the uh, 
the website as well. Uh, too bad you can't cut and paste from the slide. Well, what's, yeah, what's, we'll just. Commodore, Commodore and Russell, with your permission, maybe we can send a very short follow-up email with our contact information if you're comfortable with that. Absolutely. By all means, please do, please do. That'd be amazing, thank you. Yeah, thank good, you. thank you. Okay, and uh, we have, Miriam has an interesting comment. Miriam, you're unmuted. Oh, really? <laughs> Hold on. What was my comment? Meaning I want to get involved and join? Ah, yeah, that was a good one. It is a good one. <laughs> Are you guys familiar with Ox, uh, Roxanne Sheridan? Do you know her? No. Oh. No, oh, okay. She's involved in something with this also. So I thought maybe you guys were all involved together. Anyway, um, oh my God, you know, I come from New York State where, you know, they breed all the thoroughbreds and, you know, they live a nicer life, of course, the horses. And to see this, and I, I lived in the Southwest, so I have seen them. And, but to see the pain, I had no idea helicopters were doing this to them horses you know you know getting them all together and and actually terrifying them and then putting them into these small crates and oh god it just my heart just went out so anyway love to contact some of you i, I guess you all live around here or some of you do maybe not <laughs> yeah but anyway i would definitely would love to um you know give my help in any way, raising money. I'm good at that. Uh, I've done foundations before. So anyway, we can talk another time, but my heart was just, like I said, I live in the Southwest. I've seen the horses, but I, not in my wildest dreams could have seen, ever thought this was happening to them. So thank you for sharing all of this. Yeah. So can I answer a question? Mm -hmm. so there was a question about where we're all located so Dustin's in the city this is Terry speaking I'm in um, Menlo Park down in the South Bay mm -hmm. and then Suzanne's in Davis um, and most of our board um, actually I think all of our board is in in the Marin County area everyone except Stephanie yeah yeah so we're here yeah we're um, and they also, there was another question earlier about are there wild horses in the state of Washington? Um, no. Oh. Can't hear you now. We lost you, Terry. There you go. Now you're back. Terry? Terry? Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm losing my microphone here. Um, so I hope that the answers, and yes, we do have senators and Congress people, like Suzanne said, who help us. Um, one of the things I like to mention though is that we would love to meet with you um, if you'd like. We are looking maybe if you have relationships with um, foundations for grants. I do. Um, we are definitely looking for a Jeep for our volunteers in the high desert. I love that. <laughs> can, I, can you hear me? I don't even know. Am I? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, I, they're, like you're saying in Marin, there's a, there's a group here very involved. So perhaps you, everyone should meet. Would I love that. I Roxanne. And um, she's approached me about this before. We can all help raising money um but what i'm letting you know is i'm pretty hands-on so oh, great. wonderful yeah and i you know i wouldn't mind what, being back in the southwest <laughs> yeah. or nevada or wherever for Just a little come while to nevada and see the horses <laughs> with us yeah, yeah. Well, Miriam, uh, it, and everyone that's tom speaking i have a suggestion Miriam, since you mentioned yeah. roxanne's name roxanne sheridan yes when the club reopens um, and hopefully that'll be sometime in June. I'm, we're still looking at dates for, and a release from the county. Um, I'm more than happy to host a luncheon or dinner or whatever it happens to be at easiest mm -hmm. to introduce Roxanne and Miriam and others to um, 
the, the, uh, to Terry and Suzanne and Dustin and whomever you think is appropriate. So let's, we have a lot in common. So, let, let's let's yeah. put that on our calendar yeah. when the yeah. Yacht Club reopens that I, I'll host a dinner for everyone. That's okay. lovely. Wonderful. Well, I don't, I don't think I'm overstepping, but Alicia Getz, um, you know, one of our board members, she did offer during lockdown special opportunities. Suzanne, think that's okay to throw out there for interested parties? Yeah, definitely. Um, Alicia has, you know, 4,000 acres and 500 horses, and you don't even have to get out of your car. You can drive right through the gate and tour you through the horse sanctuary, and it's right down there in Gilroy. So while we're all still under lockdown, if anyone's interested, when we send the follow-up email, please, please let us know. I think that might be a good time to get together as well. This is why I really believe you, you should be meeting with Roxanne and, and this group because she has acres in Nevada for this. And so they've been working on this quite a bit. I am kind of on the sidelines of this, um, but now seeing, you know, I do need to get more involved. So, yeah. Okay. So you're all in, in the same place, I think. So which is good. Thank you so much, Miriam. That's wonderful. Suzanne, before we go on to other questions, do you want to acknowledge some of who our key supporters have been in the Senate and Congress, um, just to give them their, their kudos, other than Congressman Grijalva. Yeah, Congressman Grijalva has been um, our top champion. And as the chair of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, of course, he is quite a powerful ally to have. Um, now that he's in the majority again, that's good too. Um, we have... Um, we work a lot with Senator Booker's office. He has been a very strong advocate. Um, the new Congresswoman from New Mexico, Deborah Holland, Holland actually is her name. Um, she is the, the, on the Natural Resources Committee, Public Land Subcommittee, she's the chair. She's a strong advocate. Um, some Congress people from Colorado. Uh, mm -hmm. Senator Feinstein has been a great advocate mm -hmm. to standing strong against slaughter of the horses, oh. as well as for the Devil's Garden horses up north um, that have been pretty brutally treated. Um, so she's a very strong advocate. So. Governor, some of them, yeah. Governor of Arizona, wasn't it a year or oh, two yes. ago? He, yeah. you know, and he's a Republican, and he, he named it, you know, one of his number one feat while in office, I think. Yeah, he uh, did. He, he, he called it a top, one of the top 10 accomplishments of 2016 for him was saving a herd of wild horses in Nevada. I mean, I mean, in Arizona, sorry. The, the interesting thing about our issue is that it is bipartisan. We have um, we probably have the same breakdown as the country does in terms of Trump supporters versus uh, non-Trump supporters. And um, we've done polling that shows Republicans, Democrats, the support for the horses is very strong. So, um, yeah. One of the okay. things that is always interesting is that even if you don't love horses or like them, um, you should maybe care about the tax dollars, millions and millions of dollars being used um, to subsidize. And then also, if you don't care about money or horses, care about the land, the ecosystem that is being destroyed by the cattle on the land is, um, will just go to dust. So you've got three reasons to care about this issue, horses, land, and your money. And it's the right thing to do as far Perfect. We have a question from Teresa. Yes. You've been unmuted. Uh, you can just read what I asked. What I asked is, I'm, is it illegal for you to uh, fight helicopter with helicopter, so to speak, and uh, try to deter them from doing the what they're doing with the helicopters? Yeah, it's it's a federal crime. To it, they call it interfering with a government operation, and like Dustin said. They do have armed rangers out on the range. You're in like in the middle of nowhere and there's maybe like two members of the public that are with at, you know, at the trap site to view the roundup. And they'll have like two rangers and four PR people. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Um, but yeah, it would, yeah, we'd get arrested pretty quickly and it would be a federal offense. And so yeah. it's kind of a, even flying in the airspace is a big deal. Like you, 
you get in big trouble for that. Yeah, I thought that might be the case. Yeah. yeah. And drones, same issue. Same right? issue. You can't fly drones in those areas. Yeah. Sounds, sounds like you got the spirit of a wild horse. I know. There you go. <laughs> 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 that's funny okay are there any more questions for the team okay well um, thank you everyone and um, as I said when we reopen the Yacht Club we're going to have a meeting between Miriam and Roxanne and others from the American Wild Horse campaign to, um, to strategize as to what can be done so Thank you are all amazing. Thank you so much for having us Thank you um, so much. for your time and be safe, be happy, be well. And we, we look forward to your follow-up email, please. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you.